Um, what was really challenging to me initially was uh, when Tabard Theater approached me about directing two plays at the same time. Um, and, you know, the, the, the process is, is always the same, but it, it was double. So for casting, fortunately, there's only two people in, in this play, and there's only one person in uh, the other play. And so really, I only had to cast one person because this guy here, <laughs> I wanted him right away. I thought that uh, Kurt, uh, Mark Rothko is a very challenging character. And, and I think Kurt is definitely the guy to fill the shoes. You have anything to say about Mark Rothko so far? How's it been? Well, now I hope I can fill those shoes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's always challenging to play a, a historical character, a mm -hmm. real character, because it compels you to do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. uh, I was certainly aware of Mark Rothko, but not intimately aware of either Rothko or the abstract ex uh, expressionist movement. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time before rehearsals just uh, trying to learn as much as I could about the movement and about the uh, artist. Mm -hmm. And so what's been kind of exhilarating for me so far in this uh, journey is what I've been able to expand my own knowledge on and, and appreciation for the, the kind of, of uh, non-representational art that uh, Mark Rothko was able to uh, create. I don't think I had anywhere near the appreciation for what he was uh, uh, attempting to do mm -hmm. uh, until I actually started getting into the play and understanding the man uh, further. And you know, from, uh, <coughs> something about knowing Mark Rothko before getting into, involved in the process is interesting because I didn't know him by name, but I knew his work. And I think that that is yeah. something that seems to be common, at least with people that I've told about with me. coming yeah. to see this. Yeah, have you had that experience too? Yeah, I didn't know him by name, but I knew the work when yeah, I saw yeah. the Seagram mur murals. Yeah, and, I said, uh, yeah, you know, that'll be, I'm sure, will be the same experience for, for mm -hmm. a lot of people, yeah. if not all people. It's a very distinct style and kind of work that he did. And I'll just slip a little O'Keefe in here too that that also, uh, Georgia O'Keefe, maybe, maybe not. Did, did, have you heard of her before? I actually had heard her name, but I didn't associate it really specifically with any kind of style. And then I saw her work and it's like, oh, that's who she is. Okay, now I understand. Um, the character that Anthony is playing, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not an actual person, but it's kind of a composite of, of an apprentice that uh, Mark Rothko might have. And this, this story is about Mark Rothko and this, this new apprentice. What about him? And his name is Ken, which Ken. is never said in the script, by the way. So never this is the only time the you're going to hear Ken. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty interesting, right? No, Ken is a creation of the playwright to kind of serve as the... It, well, it starts with almost the antithesis to Rothko, really. And he's young, he's an undergrad, and he's serving as the sort of apprentice to Rothko, helping him, you know, work and prime the canvas and do various stuff around the studio, but not painting. Rothko is very sure to mention that <laughs> Anything we do here, you're not painting anything. Know that. Um, he can go get him groceries. He can though. get him no smokes, problem. anything he wants, but no <laughs> painting because he doesn't. He's not capable of understanding that because he tells Ken, right now you are not a real human being to be able to understand my work. And as the play goes on, it, it's, they sort of play off of all these, you know, this partnership. It's master servant, you know, apprentice master, father son almost in a way. And they, they what really happens is a power exchange, and. It gets to a point in the play where almost there, you know, we've talked about this a lot in rehearsals. It gets to a point where Ken has learned so much about Rothko that he starts to almost teach him things as well. And Rothko really does eventually at some point see him as a sort of equal. And it's really, really fun. And I think we were talking about this, the, the duality of it, the back and forth, the power mm -hmm. exchange, the hills and valleys yeah. as it goes on. You know, <laughs> where are there the times where Ken wouldn't say yeah. this and wouldn't push that line. And when does he win? Exactly, when yeah. When does Rothko win? Rothko wins a lot. Yeah. <laughs> because he just refuses to lose. But, yeah. but there are yeah. times yeah. when, and that you'll have to come see. Yeah. When does Ken win? Yeah. And, exactly, uh, you yeah. know, cause, And when is that, where is that, where or when is that mm -hmm. tipping point that mm -hmm. things change? That's but, what's but, really yeah. fun about it. The yeah. tension isn't just, <clears throat> 
between the two characters, meaning uh, what I mean by that is it's the tension also between the fact that the play takes place on the cusp of a new artistic uh, period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, we're coming out of, of uh, the early 20th century period that was dominated by Cubism and then Surrealism, which very much influenced uh, Mark Rothko. But the, the new age now, I mean, this is post-World War II, and the artists <clears throat> were now living in a post-Holocaust atomic bomb age, and they were looking for new ways of expression. And yeah. I think one of the great experiences of doing this play is I think anyone coming to the play, regardless of their uh, uh, previous knowledge in art history, they're going to learn a lot mm -hmm. uh, about these artistic movements. There are so many artists' names who are mentioned, and I think yeah. that they will, they will get a better understanding of the abstract expressionist movement. Um, when people tell me that, oh, I just don't understand uh, Rothko's paintings, and what I like to imagine is if almost everyone at some point has seen a sunset, mm -hmm. an ocean sunset, and if you imagine that for a moment, and this is, would be after the sun has already dipped below the horizon, and if you're looking out at that sunset, what you're seeing is, is the color of the sand as a kind of rectangle, and then the ocean moving from a kind of deep indigo blue to uh, almost a black, and then that band of red where the sun has just set, and then above that, the blues, the oranges, the, the yellows into the dark sky of night. And what you're looking at is a Rothko. Absolutely. You're looking at a painting. And nobody has ever looked at, at an ocean sunset and said, I don't understand that. Yeah. And so I, <laughs> Very think, good point. Yeah. I think the idea of trying to understand you know, what Rothko and the other uh, colorist paintings were doing in these massive large-scale paintings that they were creating is to no longer look at, at art as an object. That's why Rothko would never put frames around his paintings. Yeah. He would never title his paintings. He would call them orange and black or mm -hmm. red stripe or mm -hmm. something yeah. to identify them. But, but once you put a frame around the painting and give it a title, you've objectified it. It's an overmantle. And exactly. <laughs> it becomes you know, that commodity. And instead of being apart from the painting, I think Rothko wanted you to be a part of the painting. He was going for, for big things. He was going to for the sublime. He was going it, yeah. for the divine. Mm -hmm. He was going so for something the... Something divine or damned, whatever it is, I don't know. Me, but and it's beyond not fine. Now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. He didn't want to paint pretty pictures. And you know, <laughs> when you mention the sunset, I think it's an excellent example because if you were to ask a, a group of people or an individual, what color comes to mind when you think of a sunset? And they may or may not, but I think for the most part, people may come up with one color. Yeah. But when you really look <laughs> at it, like you just described, there. Mm -hmm. A There's a plethora of colors yes. there. Yeah. There's so much going on when yes. initially, like in this play, you might think a painting looks red. Yeah. But when you really look, there's a lot more going on. That's right. a, well, that's how the play begins. Is it, it's Rothko basically instructing Ken on everything we just talked about, which is you don't just look at it. It needs to be, you need to stand here with this lighting, thinking out, just let the painting swallow you. Mm -hmm. And the, he asks Ken, what do you see? And Ken says, red. And Rothko has a lot to say about what, is, what does that mean? What is red yeah. to me? You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Try this. It's a fulcrum. And then later on, about halfway through the play, when Ken is talking about his paintings, he's getting it a little more, and he starts talking about, you know, it's a fulcrum with chaos and order existing at the same time, pulsating. The painting is leading you through. And then he starts to kind of understand it a little more. And it's interesting talking about what you were saying yeah. with, you know, a lot of people that say they don't understand his paintings is he also, you know, he talks about that. He talks about in the play the people that don't understand his paintings, and there probably there there will be people that you know look at the paintings that way, which is you mm -hmm. know in your whole speech about um, what does he say? It's everything except what it is. It's anything yeah. but what it is. Right. And uh, yeah. I think that was one of the very <laughs> I love that line frustrating things in his life was that Definitely. no one ever understood him. I mean, yeah. Uh, which uh, unfortunately certainly was a huge factor in his tragic way of leaving this earth. Yeah. I mean, he was never satisfied. Um, commercially, yeah, he, financially, his pieces were worth a lot of money, but, and they're a ridiculous amount of money now, which is so ironic 
the man's not even here anymore. And, and one of his paintings, not too long ago, sold for $89 million. Million. $89 million. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't one, but I think it was a set of three. No, it was, uh, he, he did sell a single painting for close to $89 million was, at uh, Christie's. And, and yet the man died thinking that he was not a success and that no one understood yeah. him. Well, it's funny because they, there's a point in the play, um, I don't want to give too much away, but Ken sort of confronts him on the point that you know, he's acting like he's the high priest of modern art and he rants against commercialism in art and the people that pay this money and don't understand these paintings, but he is taking the money. And he's mm -hmm. taking, I, th say, I think they say one of the largest commissions at that time, oh, yeah. or mm -hmm. if not the largest. And mm -hmm. I think that was a struggle for him too, you know what I mean? Because he is taking the money and it's sort of this thing of, you know, art is being consumed by commercialism and pop art and soup cans and Andy Warhol because it takes yeah. place, it's the late 50s. Yeah. It's in the late 50s. But at the same time, he realizes, you know, I'm painting for the Seagram Corporation. And then that becomes a whole thing, is the Seagram murals. And he, he actually did say one of the lines in the play that I thought was not a real thing, but he is quoted on saying, I hope to ruin the appetite of every son of a bitch in that <laughs> restaurant. Yeah. He did say that. He wasn't yeah. the friendliest <laughs> guy in the world. No. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I think of... I don't, I don't know of any other paint, painter, and this certainly comes out in the play Red, that, that treated his paintings as living objects. Mm -hmm. I mean, he addresses them always as if they are alive. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and for Rothko, it's not just about a painting, uh, because he wants the painting displayed in a particular way. He's concerned about the height of the painting. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants it. He's, assert, he's concerned about the lighting oh, like within the museum. Thing. He's concerned about the arrangement of the paintings. What's, what really comes out in, in this play is, is how much he wants his paintings, plural, to live in a place mm -hmm. together. I mean, he doesn't want them to be alone. He actually feels like, that he doesn't want them alone. His children. Yeah. He wants them, and there's a line, he wants them working together, moving in rhythm with each other, whispering to each other, that they will always have themselves and each other for protection and safety. I mean, I've never heard of any other artist talk about his work in such a, you know, in such a personal way as if they're actually yeah. living, breathing mm -hmm. things. And he talks about how the paintings do, in fact, breathe, how they pulsate, how they move. And it's that experience, I think, that the viewer, uh, not only are the abstract e expressionists creating a different, you know, different po uh, artistic conventions, but they're demanding that the viewer has to also start to look differently, mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. to start to appreciate art as, if art is simply the, the replication of reality, oftentimes if, you know, you might look at a painting, a, a realistic painting, and, and we comment on how good it is by how well we think it replicates reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if that's all painting was, then, yeah. it, then painting would have died as soon as photography <laughs> came into existence in the latter part of the 19th century. Well, he tells Ken when Ken's <laughs> looking at the painting, he says, meet it halfway. Yes, yeah, exactly. Let it, let it swallow right. you so that nothing ever existed and ever will exist. And painting just has to painting. be more than just the replication of reality. Yeah. And he wanted to bring it down, I think, to that color is emotion and, and, and you know his, his paintings are are very uh, contemplative I think mm -hmm. you know they're they're meditative and uh, you know there's special places created for example the chapel in Houston a, a chapel that was created just for Rothko's paintings to exist in one place and uh, at the Tate Museum in, in London there's another place and I, our hope as a viewer here in this theater, uh, theater on San Pedro Square, Tabard Theater, we hope that you will, you will experience uh, art in a different way, a, a different way than you've ever experienced it before. For one thing, you're going to be taken on this journey through the actual artist, if you will, and how he felt about his art, and you'll be seeing some of his art, and how you experience it will be very different than you ever have before. Obviously, one big factor is it's a play, as well as seeing his art perhaps in the play. There's the play itself that we are also kind of um, staging in an abstract way. Uh, some things are literal, uh, physical, the physical world. Some things are literal and some things are not. Um, it's, it's a challenge and it's a, it, it's a, it's a risk. It's a risk to stage a play this way, but 
it's also exciting because it is a risk. And I hope that um, when you come that you experience red as, a, as an entire experience and Georgia O'Keeffe too. Um, we're also uh, staging that in an abstract way. And a lot of what has been said about at least the staging of Red certainly pertains to the staging of Georgia O'Keeffe's play because uh, we're using the same space, we're using the same stage. The, the, uh, the rehearsals are being uh, are taking place at the same time and we're just alternating days. So it's a very interesting <laughs> schedule that will come together and, um, and then once the plays are open, they run, uh, they alternate days, right? Yeah. 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 But I think it's interesting yeah. also about doing uh, Rothko and O'Keefe. Uh, one would not generally think of you know, two very disparate artistic styles, even though they are contemporaries. Mm -hmm. But uh, they both have, ironically, I think, a Southwest connection because, uh, you know, clearly with Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, but so too did uh, Mark Rothko. There's a story about Rothko tra traveling through the uh, Southwest with his uh, daughter and being very impressed once again at the landscapes, mm -hmm. the yeah. vistas. And you can kind of see the different way, whereas, you know, whereas O'Keeffe is, is almost kind of microscopic. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. she's blowing things up. She's looking at the, yeah. the details mm -hmm. and, in, in that Southwest landscape. And here's Rothko looking at the same landscape, but looking at it from a kind of almost macroscopic, you know. Right, He's, right. In, <laughs> instead of zooming yeah. in, he pulls away. Everything yeah. enveloping you. Yeah. Right, and so, the, and creating the vast canvas almost like the landscapes themselves, you know. Yeah. Whereas O'Keeffe is, is bringing in uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the details, mm -hmm. you know. W one is trying to capture, I think, the, the you know, the, well, they're both trying to capture the spirit, of course, but, but Rothko in, in a more kind of almost spiritual kind of way, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, O'Keeffe is, is also dealing, I think, very much, I think both of these artists are very much dealing, are very much uh, influenced by the 20th century psychology of Freud and Jung and the oh, subconscious, yeah. and so we see, yeah. we see that <laughs> manifested in very different ways yeah, yeah. with O'Keeffe and, and, and Rothko, <laughs> but, but they have that similarity, that uncon how their unconscious uh, uh, manifests itself mm -hmm. on the canvas. And, <laughs> and, and Georgia O'Keeffe as well, in a different way, yes. was also not satisfied with how her work was t taken in or accepted or perceived. Um, and uh, sh the, the, the character in, it's a one person show, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned that, but it's just one person, one woman, and um, playing the role of Georgia O'Keeffe. And it's kind of how we have looked at it is sort of uh, Georgia O'Keeffe has opened up her museum that is her mind to you and you're here for 90 minutes or whatever the time length is um, and you she will be your guide your um, what is it at the museums what uh, docent docent <coughs> or yeah she'll she'll be your guide um, but I think it's interesting that they were both not satisfied they, they not, in very different ways but they neither one of them felt satisfied with how their work was received why wouldn't you want to come see these plays? I hope that you come see these plays. Why would you want to come see these plays? Well, I think you would want to come see these plays because it's an experience and that, that will expand your life in some way, in some way. You will take something away from the experience of these artists, absolutely. Yeah, and I think also for anyone who who, f who does not feel an expression, uh, I mean a connection to non-representational art, I think this is an incredible insight into the understanding of those, uh, uh, that artistic movement. And I think that anyone coming to see these two plays is going to walk away with a, almost like taking a crash course in, mm -hmm. in, in, yeah. in uh, post-World War II, 20th century art. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to go away with a much greater understanding of that entire artistic movement and, and, and how it fits uh, in that chronology of uh, of 20th century American art, mm -hmm. I think any aside from you know learning about non-representational art, I think they talk about quite simply, to put it simply, what art means to you and what art does to people, because they both feel different things because of these paintings, and so does Georgia O'Keeffe, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically saying what does art mean to you, and this is a theater, and this is art, and it's something that makes you look at it and say, why am I here? 
Why am I looking at this? What is it doing to me? There's a part, um, once again, I won't give anything away, but Ken um, has a moment about halfway through the play where he looks at the painting and he hasn't seen it like this before. This is the same painting that's been here this whole time. And once he, he looks at it at this point and thinks about it and gets lost in it, it brings back something very traumatic from his childhood. And it makes him think a lot about it. And ever since that point forward in the play, that the art moves him like that, all the paintings in the room are different from that point forward. Mm. And painting to him, I think, is entirely different from that point forward. And, and Roscoe to Ken, looking at one of these uh, colossal <laughs> Uh, uh, paintings. Uh, he says, what do you see? And the response that Ken gives is red. At the end of the play, mm. he asks him, what mm. do you see? And the response that Ken gives is red. But the response that he gives, at the, the meaning of red at the beginning of the play is only a color, a very limited yeah. color. The meaning of red at the end of the play is so much more. And so I think anybody coming to see this play, that's what they will go away with. Yeah. Coming in thinking red is a color, and then when they leave the second time, when he says, what do you see? They too, I think, will see a different, yeah. mm -hmm. wider, yeah. and red as an, yeah. <laughs> yeah. an experience. Palette. Red as an experience, yes, mm -hmm. rather than a color. On that note, I just wanted to touch on, which is one of my favorite parts. It's not a single line, but it's the exchange with um, Ken and Rothko where, once again, Ken, um, Rothko is saying, what does it need, what does it need? And he's looking at the painting, and Ken says, red. And this sends Rothko asking, what is red? What does red mean to you? And then, <laughs> well, Ken starts describing things like red roses, red wine, red lipstick, a sunset, blush, which Rothko responds with lava, scorpions. <laughs> arterial blood. Arterial blood. <laughs> Satan. Nick, Satan. And then Ken says Santa Claus. <laughs> and then he says, you know, nick yourself shaving, blood in the sink, blood in the barbasol. And that, that whole exchange alone, I love that so much. Because that's about, that, you can say that about any art. It speaks volumes Music, right there. Music, theater. It's taken a different way. Uh, you know, writing, everything. And yeah, everyone's going to take something different away from it. Mm -hmm. So please come and join us to experience the art of Mark Rothko and Georgia O'Keeffe. We open on June 23rd and we close on July 9th. And uh, like every performance here at Tabard, um, the cast is always willing, able, and wanting to meet you. And if you'd like to exchange a few words about your experience, we invite that 100%. I just think this is a, an excellent opportunity for the community to be able to come and see two plays in repertory, which is very rarely done. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't even think of any Bay, uh, Bay Area experience where I've been able to see a play in repertory. But to see two plays that touch upon artistic themes, uh, I just think it's a great opportunity. And so uh, <coughs> please, I invite you all to come. And if you're an art historian uh, and you want to tell me other things about uh, Mark Rothko, I would be glad to hear, or if you would like me to tell you more about what I've learned on this journey uh, into 20th century American art, I'd be glad, would be more than happy to speak with you uh, after one of our performances. So we would love to have you come down to Tabard Theater, theater on San Pedro Square. We open the shows with Red on June 23rd, and we close with O'Keefe, or do we close with Red? O'Keefe closes We it, close yeah. with O'Keefe on July 9th. 9th. And I think that these are really important pieces of theater. And I, I want to know what you guys think about them. And I want to know what you think about art, too. And we would love to have you talk to us about what the play meant to you, what art means to you. And if you know anything about non-representational art going into the play, or Rothko or O'Keefe, talk to us about it. And the exciting and thing is you can see both of these plays on the same weekend, playing yes, in repertory. Yes. yes, you can. And I think it's a good idea, too. <laughs>